Good morning. Well, I can't tell you how excited I am to be uh, starting this series on uh, Philippians. We are going to, as Pastor Andy shared, we're going to take about 11 weeks. And we're going to be working really line by line through the book of Philippians. In fact, uh, this morning, I'm going to read, assuming my glasses are in my pocket, I'm going to read the first two verses, but we're actually going to even back up further. We're going to look at Acts 16 as well, which is actually the founding of the Philippian church. So if you would take a moment with me, um, we're going to read Philippians chapter 1, verse 1 and 2. Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus, to all God's holy people in Christ Jesus at Philippi, together with the overseers and deacons, grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. So, before we really dig into the book, um, a lot of you have been asking me, Pastor Dave, you know, Christmas happened, did you get the truck that you were asking for? I know that's been on everyone's minds. Well, just so happens that I did receive a package on my desk from Secret Santa. So I was pretty excited. I figured hopefully, you know, it's a set of truck keys in it. Um, it was not a set of truck keys. It was actually an entire truck. <laughs> so um, it starts and everything. Yeah, I mean, it's not exactly the truck that I was hoping for, but... Ask and you shall receive. You just need to be more specific next time. So, anyways, thank you, whoever the secret Santa was, for getting me a truck. But I am um, incredibly excited as we, as we dig into Philippians to talk about really how this church got started. We're going to be focusing on the book of Philippians, in which Paul wrote from a Roman jail cell, much like this one that Steve Putnick lives in when he's bad. But um, Paul writes his letter from jail, a letter um, about joy. And that's really incredible if you think about it, that, that Paul writes his letter um, to this church, which he had visited, which he had helped start, to encourage them, to help them to be joyful in the time when he was facing potentially death in a jail cell in Rome. So... Um, Hopefully we can all be encouraged by his words, but I want to take um, some time this morning and actually back up to Acts 16, to the founding of the church at Philippi. Philippi ends up being one of the greatest early churches. Of all the churches, when Paul goes back and he writes letters to places he visited and helped start churches, um, Philippi is maybe the one that he is most, most proud of, that has done the most good. A lot of the other letters are, are kind of critiquing them on some issues or challenges they had, but really with Philippi, it's, it's thanks for the partnership in the gospel. It's you're such a blessing to me, and it's just encouraging them to joy. So one of the things I want to look at is the fact that as Paul starts and founds this church in Philippi, he does it with some unusual suspects. He doesn't really start the church with maybe the best and brightest or the people that you might think. In fact, as we, as we talk about him, he writes this letter to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are at Philippi and offers grace and peace to them, but it's really a, a group of unusual suspects. Now, if I was going to plant a church, my, my, my dream team, my number one draft pick would be this guy right here. I mean, that's who I would pick to start a church with, right? I mean, who wouldn't want to start a church with Chuck Norris? Number one, no security issues at all, right? I mean, so, you know, Chuck Norris, you know, you've heard all the Chuck Norris jokes. He can do everything. He's amazing. And, and you want to pick out the best. But throughout history, God has a tendency to not necessarily work through the same people that we might choose. You can go all the way back in, into the first king of Israel. And the, the king that the people wanted was the strong, the rugged, the handsome, the great leader, Saul right? To be the first king of Israel. And that's who they had. But God says, no. Man looks on the outside, but God looks on the heart. And so God says he wants to anoint a new king. And he says, go to Jesse, 
And Jesse has all these sons, and I'll, I'll tell you which is the right one to pick to be the next king. And so he walks, and he sees Jesse's sons lined up, and he sees the big, strong, handsome, oh, maybe it's this one. No, maybe it's this one. No, maybe it's this one. And then they have to go back and bring the youngest, the little boy, David. Little David, who becomes the king that leads Israel, who becomes the only man in the scriptures to be called a man after God's own heart. And time and time again, God uses unusual suspects to build his church. And that's what I want to talk about this morning when we look at sort of the founding of the Philippian church. So I'm going to turn to Acts 16 if you want to follow along in your Bible as well. We're going to look at that passage, Acts chapter 16. The first unusual suspects, though, that, that really that, that God uses are really Paul and Timothy, right? Paul and Timothy, if we look at Paul, Paul was an unusual suspect. Paul, who calls himself later in the book of Philippians, a, a Pharisee of Pharisees. If you remember your history, the Pharisees were, were Jesus' enemies, right? And Paul certainly lived up to that. Paul um, was so devout in his convictions that he was actually persecuting Christians. He was actually helping put Christians to death. He was there at the stoning of Stephen, the first deacon. In fact, he's holding everyone's cloaks so they could really rear back and throw those stones. And even in his conversion, he's on the road going to find more Christians to arrest them, to throw them in jail, and to have them killed. So Paul is an unusual suspect. Timothy is an unusual suspect. He was young. He was thought by many to be too young to be a preacher. He had stomach issues, some health concerns. And yet, to even be the people who are the missionaries who start this church, he uses Paul and Timothy. So let's dig into Acts 16 and look at who else, or really how they even get there. I'm going to start in verse 6 here. Paul and his companions traveled throughout the region of Phrygia and Galatia, having been kept from the Holy Spirit from preaching the word in the province of Asia. Now, these places are probably not going to mean a lot to you, but we're going to look at a map here in a minute, so bear with me. When they came to the border of Mysia, they tried to enter Bithynia, but the Spirit of Jesus would not allow them to. So they passed by Mysia and went down to Troas. During the night, Paul had a vision of a man of Macedonia standing and begging him, come over to Macedonia and help us. After Paul had seen the vision, we got ready at once to leave for Macedonia, deciding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. From Troas, we went out to sea and sailed straight for Samothrace, and on the next day, we went on to Neapolis. From there, we traveled to Philippi, a Roman colony, and the leading city in the district of Macedonia, and we stayed there several days. So, I want to stop there for a minute and look at this map, and you may or may not be able to see, but if you can see, Paul probably started somewhere around here, around his, his, the place where he's from, Tarsus, and his goal was to get to Asia. He wanted to preach the gospel in Asia. That was his goal. That's what he wanted. But he said the Holy Spirit would not allow him to go there. So if you notice, these, these, um, a lot of these are winding. The reason they're winding is because Paul wanted to go someplace, and then the Spirit of God would lead him to another place. And so he kept traveling, and he kept wanting to make plans. He wanted to preach in Bithynia, up at kind of the top of the map. But God said no, and eventually this travel leads him to Philippi. You see, Paul had a set of plans and ideas about what he wanted and what he wanted to do, but God steered him towards Philippi and towards starting this church. So God used a strange set of circumstances even to lead Paul to get up to Philippi. He had no intentions of going to Philippi and starting this church. Philippi was a very wealthy seaport, but it wasn't necessarily a place that you would think would be the most receptive to the gospel. And yet God leads Paul there, and then the story continues on. 
In verse 11, we continue the story here. Actually, I'm going to start out a little bit later. On the Sabbath, so he's in Philippi. On the Sabbath, verse 13, we went outside the city gate to the river where we expected to find a place of prayer. We sat down and began to speak to the women who had gathered there. One of those listening was a woman from the city of Thratira named Lydia, a dealer in purple goods. She was a worshiper of God. The Lord opened her heart to respond to Paul's message. When she and the members of her household were baptized, she invited us to her house. If you consider me to be a believer in the Lord, she said, come and stay at my house. And she persuaded us. So the very first person, the first unusual suspect who Paul encounters, who becomes an important person in the planning of the church at Philippi, is this woman named Lydia. Now, that might not be a big deal to you, but back then, for a woman to be the person that God chose to be kind of the founding member of the church of Philippi would have been borderline scandalous. And this is not just any woman. This is, a, this is an unusual woman, a very successful businesswoman. All right? I mean, she's a seller of purple goods. Right? How many of you have ever met a seller of purple goods? All right, so let me give you a little context. That's basically like Nordstrom's. Not Nordstrom's rack. Nordstrom's. Right? Like, like this shirt is probably like 1995 from Sears. If I try to buy this shirt at Nordstrom's, it's $400. All right? That's kind of what a seller of purple goods would be like. This is, purple was the color of royalty, the color of prestige, eliteness. So she would have been selling very fine linens and cloths to people. A very successful businesswoman. And so God calls this woman who ends up inviting Paul to her house. And most historians agree that the place where the Philippian church first begins is in Lydia's house. This woman, Lydia, becomes an unusual suspect who God uses to start this amazing early church. Let's get to our next unusual suspect. Picking up in verse 16. Once we were going to the place of prayer, we were met by a female slave who had a spirit by which she predicted the future. She earned a great deal of money for her owners by fortune telling. She followed Paul and the rest of us shouting, These men are servants of the Most High God, and they're telling you the way to be saved. She kept saying this for many days. Finally, Paul became so annoyed that he turned around and said to the spirit, In the name of Jesus Christ, I command you to come out of her. At that moment, the spirit left her. When the owners realized that their hope of making money was gone, they seized Paul and Silas, dragged them into the marketplace to face the authorities. They brought them before the magistrates and said, These men are Jews are th are, and are throwing our city into an uproar by advocating customs unlawful for us Romans to accept our practice. So, the next unusual suspect that God ends up using is another woman. And not just another woman, but it's a slave girl. A slave girl who is not just a slave girl, but a demon-possessed slave girl. And you might think, well, I don't understand why Paul got so upset. She was giving him a nice introduction. Listen to these men. They're, they're proclaiming the good news about how you can be saved. She's like a walking MC, introducing them everywhere they went. The problem is, you have to realize this. What if everywhere you went, there was a crazy person introducing you? Do you think people would listen? No. If there's a crazy person introducing you everywhere you go, they're not going to listen to your message. They're probably going to leave. Right? And they know who this is. They know this is the, the demon-possessed girl who has been predicting the future for everyone. So the reality is this was getting so annoying. So Paul turns around. He casts the demons out in the name of Jesus Christ. And what what happens? This girl ends up becoming another follower of Jesus who ends up staying in the house of Lydia and becomes a person who is key in starting the early Philippian church. So the first two unusual suspects, we have Lydia, 
a wealthy woman who sells purple goods. We have a demonically possessed slave girl. Wow, dream team, right? We're working on it. The next person we get to actually comes because of this. Because of this, Paul and Silas get thrown into prison. They're thrown into jail, okay? And many of you probably have heard this next story we're going to get to, all right? So they're in jail. They're not just in a regular jail cell. They're in the inner part of the jail, and their legs are in stocks, okay? They they're literally have chains around their legs that are bolted to the floor. They're in the inner jail cell, and, but yet they are experiencing joy. They're, they're praying and singing praises to God up into midnight. And then all of a sudden... All of a sudden, listen to what happens. Picking up in verse 25. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying, singing hymns to God, and the other prisoners were listening to them. Suddenly there was such a violent earthquake, the foundations of the prison were shaken. At once, all the prison doors flew open and everyone's chains came loose. The jail, so what do you think the prisoners did? They ran. They took off. All right? This is like Prison Break, the TV show, except instead of five seasons, it happens like that. Easy plan. As soon as there's an earthquake, we're going to run. All right. So the jailer sees this, and he, he flips out. He's like, oh, my goodness, I have one job. What's the jailer's one job? We're going to keep all the prisoners in the prison. And now all the prisoners leave. But particularly, he had to keep Paul and Silas in there and keep them safe and keep them locked up. And so the jailer says, oh my goodness, what's, what am I going to do? He pulls out his sword. He's going to end his life. Because he knows it's, it's probably going to end anyways. Because he let the prisoners get free. But Paul and Silas say, no, wait, 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 wait. We're still here. We didn't go anywhere. Ultimately, that gives them an opportunity to share their story with the jailer. The jailer and his entire household become Christians. And now we have the foundation for the early church. This core group, this Philippian jailer, this hard, tough man. You usually put your toughest, harshest soldier in charge of the jail. You have this wealthy woman and a slave girl, and their families. And you have the foundation with that group for this church, which becomes the greatest early church in Christendom. And so I want to talk about, this is a great story, and it's nice, and it's good to know the background for the book of Philippians, but I want to talk about what does that mean for me and for you? Because when it comes to the history of God and the redemptive history, and we look at all the Bible, the truth is God uses unusual suspects like the jailer, like the slave girl, like throughout history, like David. And God uses us regardless of our past. No matter what you think in your past might keep you from God using you, God used you, God used Paul who is killing Christians, throwing them in jail, and proud of it. God takes that guy and uses him to be the missionary for the early church, the main, most thought of missionary, the guy who wrote more than half of the New Testament, the same guy who's cr killing Christians. God uses us regardless of our past. The next truth is God uses us regardless of our situation, right? Here's a slave girl. She's enslaved. She's possessed by a demon, all right? Those are two strikes against you for God using you right there. Yet God takes that situation and works it somehow for his good. God uses this slave girl ultimately to build his church. God uses us regardless of our circumstances, Here's a Philippian jailer. His job is to keep Paul and Silas in prison. He's supposed to be harsh. He is working for the city of Philippi. His job is to keep order. 
God takes his in the midst of his circumstances and situation, and God uses him. He has him come to faith. His entire family is baptized, and they become a pillar of the early Philippian church. God uses us regardless of our experience. If we were going to start a church, we wouldn't pick any of those people. We would pick someone with experience and training. Someone who is equipped for the job. But God can use us regardless of our experience. You don't have to be trained. You don't have to have a background. God will use you is simply if you're willing. In fact, the reality is that God uses us because of our lack of experience. God uses us because of our past. God uses us because of our circumstances. In fact, God orchestrates the entirety of our experience, our life, our history, our past to make us his masterpiece. Ephesians 2.10, we are God's workmanship. Again, a better word from the Greek would be masterpiece. We're God's masterpiece, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Maybe you think God can't use you. Maybe you think God doesn't want to use you. I promise you that we can all have more joy because not only does God want to use us, but God will use us if we are simply willing. I want to close our time with a story. It's one of my favorite stories. And it's a story of a man that probably none of you have heard of before. A man named Edward Kimball. Anyone heard of Edward Kimball? No, he didn't make the Kindle. That's another guy. Edward Kimball was a guy who had had a rough background as a youth. He had gotten himself into some trouble, had some run-ins with the law, and he'd found Jesus. And he was talking to his pastor, and he said, Pastor, I have this desire to be used by God, but I have no experience. I have all this trouble in my past. I don't know anything about anything. But I want to be used by God. The pastor said, well, to be honest, you're really not qualified for anything. But we have a huge need. We have this group of rowdy teenage boys, and no one will teach their Sunday school class. No one will do it. We get volunteers in there, and they quit after a week or two. Well, Edward Kimball said, Pastor, I'll do it. I'll do it. I'm willing. I don't know what I'm doing. I don't know how I'm going to do it, but I'll, I'll try. Well, Edward Kimball got in there, and he made it his life's goal that he was going to be a great Sunday school teacher, and he... he developed a love and care and concern for these boys, and he would pray for them every day. And he made it his goal. He wanted to see every single one of these young boys come into a relationship with Jesus. And some of them began to. But there was one boy in particular that, that just didn't, didn't seem to get it, didn't seem to get the message. And he was working as a shoe salesman, and so Edward Kimball went by to, to go buy some shoes and, and get some time with this young man. And he began a deeper conversation. And as he talked to this young man, he received Christ for the very first time. And that man is someone maybe a little more familiar, a man named D.L. Moody. Now more of you have probably heard of D.L. Moody, but that's not the end of the story. That's just where the story begins because D.L. Moody gives up trying to become an entrepreneur and becomes a famous evangelist spreading the gospel all over, and he le leads a man by the name of Wilbur Chapman to Christ. And Wilbur Chapman, in turn, now becomes an evangelist, and he preaches to thousands of people. And one day, Wilbur Chapman is preaching, and as he's preaching, there's a baseball player in the audience, a baseball player named Billy Sunday, a center fielder. And Billy Sunday accepts Christ. 
And more of you may know that Billy Sunday now becomes a famous evangelist as well. In his day, the greatest. And Billy Sunday begins traveling and preaching and leads a man by the name of Mordecai Ham to Christ. And Mordecai Ham becomes a pastor. And Mordecai Ham travels spreading the gospel and he famously goes into towns and, and he's, very, he's very in your face. He calls people on their stuff and so he, he goes to Charlotte, North Carolina and Mordecai Ham hears that right across from the high school there's a house of ill repute. And the high school boys are sneaking out of class and going to pay visits. And so Mordecai Ham goes into the house of ill repute and he walks in there and he begins proclaiming the gospel in there. And in walks a young boy named Billy Frank. Well, that's what his parents call him at least. He goes by another name, Billy Graham. And Billy Graham becomes a Christian. And Billy Graham, you've all heard of, probably the greatest evangelist, at least since the Apostle Paul, <laughs> preaching to literally millions of people. And all of this happens, this great, amazing story happens because one man, Edward Kimball, who had no experience, who had a rough past, who had tough circumstances, because he wasn't good or particularly gifted, but he was willing. And God used that one man to make an incredible difference in his kingdom. And we can all have more joy because God wants to use you to do amazing things. And he will use you if you're simply willing. Amen.